1 Corinthians chapter 12. We have this statement in verse 3. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, this, this question has come up. This question has been sent to the uh, Ask Pastor Tim questions, and I think that this is a good one to deal with. I, I think it gets us thinking. So let me ask you this. I mean, I have a feeling that if you got saved and you started reading through your Bibles and you came to 1 Corinthians 12, if you were not just mindlessly reading the Bible, if you actually slowed down at all to actually read and think and ask questions, probably if you read this, that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing that would jump out at me right off, right, right on the surface. It sounds like it's saying that no one can say Jesus is Lord unless what's true of you and your relationship to the Spirit. That is why I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, it, it would apparently seem that you must be a possessor of the Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. That the Spirit must dwell within you. I mean, do lost people have access to the Spirit? Actually, what does Romans 8 teach us? That if you don't have the Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. But everybody that has the Spirit, they belong to Christ. Very hallmark of the Christian is that the guarantee of our inheritance is that we have the Spirit of God. The very characteristic of the natural man is that he can't discern spiritual things. Why? Because he doesn't have the Spirit. The Spirit who knows the mind of God. Right? So as soon as we read this, it sounds like what it's saying is, well, only a Christian could say that Jesus is Lord. And it's, it's almost like if, when you read that, it's like, well, is that, is that what it means? Is that, is that what it sounds like it's saying? Lawrence says yes. That's what it sounds like it's saying. You I mean, all, you could only say it in truth if he was Lord, and you're like, otherwise you wouldn't call someone Lord, would you? you know, no, it won't, won't be honest. Perhaps. Per but isn't it interesting how he says it? He says, no one can say. See, what you're saying is, well, if somebody truly believed it, they'd be a believer and but but see that's that would be saying, well, if somebody says it and they truly believe it. But isn't it interesting Paul doesn't emphasize that. He just says you can't say Jesus is Lord. And you know what? You read that and it's like, well, that can't be true. I mean, where in Scripture would would it seem would disprove that idea? Matthew 7. Yeah, Matthew 7, verse 21. Jesus himself said, not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, right? And so what were they saying? They were saying the Lord. And in the end, they're told to depart, and obviously they didn't have the Spirit. So what do we do? Can unsaved people without the Spirit say this? Well, of course they can mouth it. Is it possible that they could even recognize that Jesus is Lord, even though they don't submit to him? I mean, perhaps. But I, I just ask you this. When you were lost... Did you have the ability to say 
Jesus is Lord? Yeah, yeah you, you could mouth the words. That's, that's for certain. So, and, and the thing is, it seems so absolute, right? I mean, oftentimes, I think when we're reading scripture, that's one of the things that, that we do have to recognize is absolute statements or statements that sound absolute oftentimes are not. And, and look, that doesn't mean it's not true. We speak that way. I mean, how many times do we say, you always say, and, you know, the truth is they don't always say. We often use words like that because we're trying to drive home a point, even though the, the talker and the hearer both understand that it's not absolute. But we talk in absolutes, kind of like Jesus. It, and sometimes it can be hyperbole. You need to hate your mother and father. But Scripture often speaks in these dogmatic terms that we recognize, well, there, there are exceptions. And if you actually start thinking through Scripture, because I think, I mean, look, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's pretty absolute, right? But, but what we have to do is we have to, we have to ask questions. Can you think about something Jesus said that sounded really absolute, but if you really start thinking, you can probably think of exceptions? Anyway, we just made a slight adjustment so that we could hear you, Sonny. So, oh, right, sorry, I was a bit like a hyperbole, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, thing, the thing is, there Jesus is speaking distinctly hyperbolically, but can you think of somewhere where it just, it seems, I think swearing oaths is, is probably something that if we look at very closely, you can probably find in Scripture where godly people do use oaths, even in the New Testament, where it's even something that God did. God swore an oath. And I think that oftentimes what we have to do is consider the context. How were the Jews in Jesus' day using oaths? Well, they were, they were very flippantly swearing about this and swearing on the, the head of this or swearing by the, the money that was being given at the altar. They were doing all sorts of things. And Jesus, Jesus comes down on that in very dogmatic terms. Um, when Jesus says, let me give you another example. When Jesus says, don't resist evil, now, can you think where, if, did Jesus teach that if somebody asks you for something that you should give it? Does he say it unqualified? Like, wow, it sounds like anything somebody asks me for, I should give. Well, even, even Christ himself, even people demanded to see a sign from Christ and he didn't show it. Exactly. I mean, see, I think that this is, these are perfect examples where Jesus says something, but then even he didn't give everything to everybody who wanted anything. And, and I think if we start thinking, well, if somebody walks in and they want to take my house, what if somebody walks in and they want to take my children? Should I let them? Well, if you take Jesus in an absolute sense, it seems like it. And I don't know if you're aware, but the Amish in the United States, they basically have that mindset. And so if somebody walked into their house and was going to rape their wife or steal their furniture or burn their house down, they basically have a mindset of non-resistance, and that I, which I think is absolutely crazy. So anyway... What, what it, the point I'm making is oftentimes, and I think if you if you pay close attention to Scripture, I think you have to wrestle when you get terms that seem very dogmatic. Like you really have to start asking. Well, in the context, should I take this in an, in the most absolute sense, or is there a context here that seems to be indicating 
uh, you know, maybe there's, there's some kind of excess or there's some kind of sin that was prevalent in Jesus' day that he's really going after. And in fact, what is Paul addressing? You always want to look at the context. And so let's look at it. Look at, look at verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts. Okay, that's key. Concerning spiritual gifts. Why is that key? Well, it's key for this reason. If you look at those words, just, just the word concerning. 1 Corinthians is interesting because that word comes up more than in any of other epistles that Paul wrote. Just jump back to chapter 7. I want you to see something. This, it, this actually shows up in chapter 7 twice, in chapter 8, chapter 16 twice. shows up here in chapter 12. But I want you to see the first six, remember this, the first six chapters of 1 Corinthians, you know what they're about? Chloe's people came to Paul. Paul was in Ephesus, and they said, Paul, there's problems at Corinth. The people are messed up. They're suing each other. There's divisions there. And so you know what he does for six chapters? He deals with those problems that were brought to him. But you know what else it seems like Chloe, Chloe's people did? They took questions to him from the church at Corinth. And look at this. Look at verse 7. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote. And see, so everywhere through here, look at verse 25. Now concerning the betrothed. And if, if we keep going through here, look at chapter 8, verse 1. Now concerning food offered to idols. You see, what he's doing is he's... It concerns the matters about which they wrote. They asked him questions. And you can see that in 7.1. Here's the question they wrote. Here's what they wrote to him. It's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's not what Paul's saying. That's what they basically had written to him. That that's the position they had come to. And he says, well, hold on. Because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband, and they should be giving themselves to each other all the time. And so basically he's answering. And in his answers, he's often correcting misconceptions on their part. And so that's what's happening here. Now look at 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers. See, they had written to him about the spiritual gifts. This is key. What is 1 Corinthians 12? 13 and 14 most well known for. What do you have in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 more than you have anywhere else in all the Bible? The, the gifts in the church. The spiritual gifts in the church. What two, what in, in these three chapters, what two gifts get mentioned more than any other? Prophecy and tongues. Prophesy, yeah, right, prophecy and tongues. They both are mentioned upwards of 20, 21 times. That's a lot. That's a lot. And see, Paul is undoubtedly dealing with especially those two gifts because they had asked him a question. You know what? We don't know what question they ask. Back when it came to sexual relationships, he tells. He basically tells what they, what they said. Here, we don't know. All we know is they asked something. So I would say we can probably get a good feel for the nature of the question that they asked simply by how he answers. Notice this. I do not want you to be uninformed. In other words, whatever question they asked, he recognized they were uninformed. So here's, here's the thing. You know, that, now just watch this. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Now you want, just think about that. And what that probably means about the question that you know that when you were pagans, okay, so he, apparently they're asking about spiritual gifts. 
something apparently happened where somebody said Christ is accursed, or they, they spoke negatively of Christ. You know, saying Jesus is accursed is just a very concise way to basically include anything negative that could be said about Christ. But this isn't in a vacuum. This isn't what the guy down the street can do. They're asking about spiritual gifts. Something must have happened inside one of their meetings. And something, especially with regards to prophesying or tongues, something must have been prophesied or something was spoken in tongues. And it did not put Jesus Christ in the greatest light. That seems like what's happened. Now notice what he says. You know when you were pagans. Now, why is he taking them back to their pagan days? Remember, these are Corinthians, Corinthian Christians, but they had pagan days. What did they do in their pagan days? What did they do? Idol worship. Idol worship. They were involved with idols, the occult. And look, he says this. He says that they were led astray. However, you were led do you remember what was said just back like one and a half chapters before this when Paul's talking about the idols? What does he say is behind the idols? Demons. Demons. That's what he says back in chapter 10. Demons are behind the idols. You know what? These were leading spirits. You say leading. Yeah, they led people. They led people somewhere. And that's what Paul's saying. Now, why would he bring that up? Obviously, because he's saying, hey, remember how it was when you were pagans? Supernatural things may have happened then. There were certain leadings. There were certain things, whether people had visions, whether people, you know, people may have had some supposed revelations or prophesyings from their God back then. But he's saying, hey, you need to remember how that happened. And he's basically bringing that out. And see, when he says, therefore, I want you to understand, no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. You recognize what he's saying. He's dealing with spiritual gifts. He's saying, hey, guys, if, if you have somebody prophesying or speaking in tongues and it's truly the gift from the Spirit, if it's truly be done in the power of the Spirit, if the Spirit is moving you, guess what the Spirit will never do? What will the Spirit never do? Say Jesus is the Spirit will never speak negatively about Christ. Ever. Not ever. In fact, you know what's really key? Well, think about this. What did Jesus say in John 16 that the Spirit would do when he came? Um, judge the world. But what does he say after? What does he say in verse 14? Lead you into all truth. Lead you into truth. Are you comfortable? He will glorify me. He will glorify me. You know what the Spirit's business is in this world? To glorify Christ. Now, listen to me. Listen very carefully, everybody. Even right now, we have people who come from charismatic backgrounds or Pentecostal backgrounds who visit the church. That will happen in the future. You know what? Sometimes God is moving these people towards greater amounts of truth. Sometimes they left there and God's moving them. Sometimes God puts people on a journey from, you know, they get some truth in the Pentecostal circles, but God moves them on to more truth. But I'll tell you this. We have a responsibility to test the spirits. When you get around people that talk about the Spirit all the time, that is not 
a good indication that the Spirit is at work. The Spirit did not come to glorify himself. We're, I have found throughout the years that people in charismatic circles talk about the Spirit all the time. You, know, you want to know one of the hallmarks of a genuine church is where Christ is glorified. That is the greatest proof that the Spirit of God is at work. Why? Because he came to glorify Christ. And just listen to this. You probably know these. In 1 John, this, this, is, this is absolutely essential. 1 John chapter 3, chapter 4 rather. Notice, beloved, do not believe every spirit. Well, you see what Paul was just saying. Hey, you remember your pagan days? Supernatural things happened back then. Remember those demons? Remember how you were led? Remember that idol worship? Remember what happened? Well, now you're a Christian. Now the Spirit of God is at work. But hey, guess what? There's still a real possibility that these leading spirits that you knew in your pagan days, they're still operating. And you know what? Clearly what he's saying is they even operate at times within the church walls. That's his point. Because they're writing, undoubtedly. You know what? In one of their meetings, it's like, well, wait a second. We've got all these gifts functioning among us. And they did. They had a whole gamut of gifts. This, they had gifts of knowledge and of wisdom and, and miracles and healing and tongues and prophesying. And I mean, they had all sorts of gifts. Supernatural things were happening. But Paul is saying, you know what? Supernatural things happen when you were lost too. And you need to be really careful. And the way you want to measure this, look at right here. Look at 1 John 4. Beloved, don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Well, see, now if you just stopped right there, oh yeah, yeah, we need to be careful. We need to test the spirits. Yeah, but test. What's my measuring stick? What am I going to measure the spirits by? What am I going to compare them to? Oh, keep going. Notice this. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Isn't that interesting? Test the spirits. By this you know the Spirit of God. You see, he's interested in exactly the same thing that Paul's interested in. How can you tell where the Spirit of God is active? Well, here it is. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess is not from God. Did you catch this? Now, see, you could look at this and say, well, this isn't talking about Jesus being accursed. Oh, but it really is in the same vein. What does it mean when you say Jesus is accursed? What are you saying when you say Jesus is Lord? You're saying the truth about Jesus. What is it when you say Jesus came in the flesh? You're saying the truth about Jesus. When you say he's accursed, you're speaking blasphemous error. And when you say he didn't come in the flesh, you see what we want to listen for. And, and I'm telling you, this will be practical in our church. All over the years, it's always practical. You can gauge so much. I mean, right down to children making professions in the church. Why? What do, what do you mean? I'm listening. When a child, if you have a seven-year-old, if you have a 16-year-old, and they claim God has saved them, if they're saved, they've been born of the Spirit. They possess the Spirit. And guess what that Spirit will do? It doesn't matter if you're seven years old or 97 years old. What does the Spirit do? He magnifies Christ. And if somebody comes to me and they say, I'm saved, you let them talk for 15 minutes. They don't mention Christ. If somebody comes into the church and, and just listen, listen, you can test the spirits right here.
And so what Paul is actually saying is this. He's saying concerning spiritual gifts. Look, if the Spirit gives a gift of prophesying or is energizing the gift of tongues, he will never move upon somebody to speak negatively of Christ. This is the issue. You know what John MacArthur said? Yeah, I remember him telling a story about meetings where a missionary was observing a man speaking in tongues in the meeting, and he said, that sounds familiar. And so he went and got a friend of his who was a Hebrew scholar, and he brought him to the meetings. He said, I want you to hear, we have an individual in the church, and they speak in tongues, and I think it's a valid tongue, and I think it's Hebrew. And so he brought a Hebrew scholar, and the man was cursing Christ, and nobody knew it. And here's the problem. A lot of times, guys who say they're interpreters, they're phonies. Right as well as people who claim to speak in tongues, they're phony. But, but the fact is, sometimes people really are speaking in tongues. And it's, it's according to 1 Corinthians 12. And sometimes they're being led along just like people in their pagan days. And so we need to be very careful and we need to test. We need to test everything. And uh, listen, folks, let me, let me tell you something. The supernatural deceives 99% of the time. It's amazing. People see supernatural and they just conclude. I mean, Jesus even said, Jesus even spoke about so much supernatural that, that even, even maybe if possible, the elect would be deceived. You remember that? The fact is supernatural things deceive people easily. We don't want to be deceived. It doesn't matter if it's supernatural. Be careful. Listen carefully. Because I'll tell you this. Demonic spirits will never exalt Jesus Christ. Ever. You say, well, what if they, what if they did it trying to deceive? Well, that's like Jesus dealing with people who said, oh, he casts out demons by, by the, you know, the chief of the demons. No, Jesus said a kingdom divided against itself won't stand. So they're not going to go around and speak positive things about Jesus Christ. And, and only the Spirit of God does that. And so that's the issue. That's really what's on the table here. It concerns spiritual gifts. So anything more with that before we move on? And, and you, you know one of the problems... Do you remember one of the problems at Corinth? You remember why he's having to say so much about tongues? Because they were boasting in it. You know what happens when people get proud about things? You can It's very easy to become blinded. It's like, and I think this happens in charismatic circles a lot of times. It's almost like, well, if somebody has a vision or somebody has some, something supernatural happen or somebody apparently casts out a demon and then, you know, people walk around gloating about it. Oh, look what I did. It's kind of what was happening there at Corinth. And you have to be careful. You start getting where you're boasting and being proud. This is why Paul says, you know what? When it comes to using the gifts, love needs to dictate you guys are way too much stuck on yourselves here. And, uh, and you know what? Pride will, will be an open door because the devil will use proud people. and The devil can do supernatural things. And we just be careful. So humility and just Christ being exalted. The point is this. The word subjective, what does that mean? 
it's opinionated, isn't it? It's like a lot of Subjective things are things that happen to you individually. They're, they, it, it has to do with the subject, and it can have to do. It can have to do with our meetings. It can have to do with uh, how gifts are used right in our midst. We always want to test the subjective by the objective. This is our objective ruler, folks. Everything has to be tested by this book. This is why it's so essential that we know it, especially know what Scripture says about Christ. Why? Why do you think John is saying what he's saying in 1 John? You know what false prophets do? You know what false apostles do? False Christ do? The fact is that false teachers come along, and if there's anything you have to watch out for, I'll tell you this. Mark it down. The devil goes after two things, the Word of God and the Son of God. Now he'll attack the Trinity, he'll attack, he attacks truth. But if you want to watch, you just look historically, you want to watch where he attacks? He attacks the person and work of Jesus Christ and he attacks this book. He hates, yea, has God said. Right from the beginning, that was his approach. So take, take that to heart. Always test the subjective by the objective. We always have to do that.